So I wanted to bring you back out into the field and help you understand some of the big differences between manufactured homes and site built homes. So I'm going to flip this around. This is a home that we moved in a little while ago, double wide, around 1100 square foot. Um, the section here is the seam that connects them two together and they transport down the road each separate section. They have their own respective frame, individual frame, as well as tongue that's put on the front and wheels. And when they go to get it prepped for moving, uh, they will separate it, split it, go underneath, uh, take up all the skirting, remove all the blocking once obviously they have wheels and axles underneath it, and get the tongue on it and move it down the road. And then once it gets on site, it's connected. There's lag bolts that go all the way up across the top of the roof and then their shingles put over the top to help make it watertight. Um, you can have modular homes which are built in sections and transported and you can also have panels, panelized homes. That's very common actually with um, with uh, situations where there is a lot of um, similar construction. I've seen a lot in uh, apartments type complexes, condos recently is the panelized construction. One of the biggest things uh, with manufactured homes that makes them different is lot rent. Okay, um, It's kind of like an HOA. You are paying a monthly fee for the right to be at this spot on somebody's land unless you own the land. Obviously that's a different scenario and that would be considered real property. We're talking when we're talking about manufactured homes in this sense we're talking about ones that are sitting on leased land, okay? So somebody else owns the land, gave us permission. Typically, they're going to evaluate uh, the condition of the home. When this first came in, it did not look this good. <laughs> uh, it had been sitting in a field in somebody's farm for a very, very long time. Uh, and what we did is we took care of the issues on the outside of the home uh, and painted it and a bunch of other things and made it look really, really, really good. So... Um, it's now, because we ended up giving a plan to the park, as far as what we were planning on doing it, they had no problem with us going ahead and bringing it in, fixing it up, and having it as a home that they have now space filled in their community. Um, the permit process, quite a bit different than the permit process that you would have um, in regular site built homes. Uh, typically, typically you have a transportation permit to get across state lines and also to run on roads. Um, your moving company will typically take care of that. And then you have to have the city come out and do an inspection of the home with the way that it was set up. It has to be set up to manufacture specs. So that means that the piers and everything that's underneath, uh, as well as also the per porches that come off and the way they're allowed to come off of the home are done in a manner that is kosher for code specifically for the area in manufactured home communities. So it's a little bit different. Uh, the other thing then, because <clears throat> we're still working on this one, is then also all the utility hookups when it's moved in. This one's gonna need a new uh, pedestal put in. And we had originally a gas connection here. City didn't like where it was. Gas company didn't like where it was in proximity to the electric, even though it's been here since like the 60s. We had to move that. So now that gives you a little more perspective about the home. Let's move to the front of the house, as you can see there. So the park will typically take care of all of the land specific type of improvements, but the actual connection points like this one right here on the home, we had to take care of and pay for. So we had to pay for setup. So we had to pay for transport. So tear down and prep, we had to pay for transport. Depending on your area, all those things cost different money, amounts of money, different permitting processes. Typically your mover and your setter will have an understanding of what those costs are gonna be, what the responsibilities will be. And then we got it set here and now we're doing the rehab. So we had somebody go in and do the exterior. And since we don't have heat yet and it's in the middle of the winter, we don't have electric yet. Um, we are waiting for that to be able to do some of the stuff on the interior. So site-built homes, 
permitting process a bit different. Obviously, they will still want it to be healthy and safe and habitable, but they do check the uh, manufacturer specs on the home with what they recommend for the area, for the region. Each region, if it has seismic activity, is going to have different requirements than a place that maybe has uh, 160 mile an hour winds, you know, wind zone four, if you will. So there's a little bit of a different setup. They will check that based off of those specs in the city a process. Um, so the park then is going to be charging rent from the time in which it's moved in, typically, unless they give you some sort of grace period. Uh, we happen to have some sort of concession that was given to us, which is a monetary amount for an incentive to move the home in and set it in their community. We were reimbursed with that amount. But until this home has all of those things finished, we're still sitting here just waiting for everybody to take care of their part so that we can do our part um, on the inside. So sometimes there's some obstacles and some things that, that come up with this process that are quite a bit different than site-built homes, but still there's a permit process. You don't necessarily have to worry about the moving process when you're doing site-built homes. Uh, you do have some logistics with materials and stuff. So I guess to a point it's similar, but not exactly the same. Uh, you do also have with uh, mobile homes from some other various different nuances as well. Some of those things would be, depending on your area, it would be registered like a, a car. So it would be a DMV registration. Some areas they charge personal property tax on cars. And so they would charge taxes, uh, personal property taxes on the mobile home. Uh, DMV typically is the one that handles the titles when it's sitting on leased land in all areas. So that's another thing pretty consistently throughout the U.S. that you're going to have. You'll have a title transfer. You do want to take that title down to the DMV ASAP to have it transferred from one owner to you so that somebody doesn't go in and get a duplicate title and basically steal the home because the most recent title issued is the one that's valid. And that's essentially like the deed that has been transferred from one party to another in a site built home scenario. So that's one that gives you the right to sell the home. Um, even though you might be listed on taxes and, and paying lot rent, the person that has the title is the person that has ownership, just like a regular vehicle would be. The thing that's great with these is that your costs to close are next to nothing. Uh, if you're working with an organization like 21st Mortgage or Triad or some of the bigger lenders, uh, nationwide lenders within an area, um, there will be some additional closing costs and paperwork and things that are done. But essentially, with one person to another, essentially what you have is you just take the title. If they're paying you off in full, uh, they bring a cashier's check or they wire, wire transfer money into your account. You endorse the title over to them from seller to them. They take it to the DMV, you give them keys, they've taken over the lease with the community, and you guys are basically done and moving forward uh, away from each other. You don't have to worry about any sort of title company doing a title search or any of that other stuff. Now, if you're buying one from somebody, my recommendation in order to protect yourself is to make sure that you are checking to see if they have the most recent title. Uh, you can actually... If you can get the VIN number, confirm that who the owner is and what the, who has the most recent title uh, currently listed with the DMV. Just because they have a title doesn't mean that they currently own it, that their most recent owner, as we were just talking about. The other thing is, is who's paying the taxes or who has the most recent registration on it, meaning paying for the registration fee. Uh, those are going to be indicators as well as also who's on lease and a lot of times the park manager is going to know the history of the home especially if they've been there for a while and so they can end up giving you some information as to who really is the lawful owner now trying to find so if somebody doesn't have title i don't recommend actually buying it from them until they've resolved that they can file for duplicate title it's a lot easier for them to do that rather than you just receiving a bill of sale and then trying to fight to find it because typically what's going to end up happening is is you'll have to have a vin verification and if the home has been transported multiple times uh, been remodeled refaced like this one has it's going to be pretty difficult for, to be able to find um, the the VIN, in some cases, on this home. Now, if there's a data plate that's on the inside, it's a piece of paper that identifies the specifics of the home as to what it was manufactured, where it was manufactured, when it was manufactured, uh, specs of the home, what zone rating it was rated for, all that stuff, uh, that 
that can also help out. But a lot of cases on the frame, front of the frame here, behind the skirting, there'll typically be um, some information stamped on there. And typically it's pretty long and it'll be a combination of numbers and letters, just like your typical VIN would be on the home. Now, I'm not talking about the HUD plate, which is the red plate on the back of the home. Um, each transportable section typically has one of those on anything that's been built uh, post 76, June of 76. So each transportable section, typically in the right-hand corner, lower right-hand corner, will typically have a red plate. I don't remember if we popped that one off on this one or not, but uh, typically that is something that can help with just identifying that it has been built to HUD standards. It is not going to have the VIN number on it. So just continuing inside, just helping to differentiate the difference. So this is inside. Obviously, we haven't been able to do a lot of work. We can't paint or do flooring yet because we don't have heat. And overnight, we're down below 20 degrees. But I wanted to bring you inside. Um, a lot of them, uh, the better manufacturers are typically going to have 2 by 4 exterior walls. Depending on where it's coming from, the truss system will be more robust or not. If it's for a area where there's high, heavy snowpack, like up in the Dakotas, uh, Montana, you know, places like that, typically you're going to have a scenario where it's going to be um, quite a bit more robust truss system up there. This is the marriage line right here. Pieces connect. Can actually kind of see where the connection was. So two pieces brought in, cinched together with lag bolts, and then that's where we've been fixing the drywall uh, to be able to clean it up and get it prepped for paint. Uh, this home actually fared quite well. So a lot of times the interior walls are going to be uh, a two by three, sometimes with some two by fours. So a little bit different construction. Sometimes you have two by six exterior walls and two by four interior walls. It depends on how uh, basically like it was at the uh, was it the Tahoe or was it the Spark, <laughs> if you will, in the Chevy line kind of a thing. Um, a lot of times the cabinets will either be like a particle board kind of a scenario if it's a less lower grade mobile home or more of a wood base. Or if it's been remodeled, there could be additional things. In some cases, the big thing for the manufacturer is the weight. Um, you have to transport it down the road, right? So there is weight or weight limits that um, any of the roads have requirements for as well. So, you know, this home definitely had sat out in the elements for quite a while. And since I don't have electric in here, I can't turn the lights on. So hopefully you can still see this. Um, this one is drywall, tape and texture. So we do have that in this one. Not all of them are. The ceiling obviously is not. That's a typical ceiling for a manufactured home with battens in between and kind of like a foam. Um, it's almost kind of like the... Uh, it's kind of almost like the drop ceilings, but with a, a sealant over it. It's got kind of a shiny sheen to it. I don't know if you can see there. Uh, so that... It's a different type of material than we typically would find, obviously, in a standard house. We do use a variety of different types of, you know, home type of scenarios. So, uh, as you can see on the wall there, we've been fixing some of the seams to clean those up quickly. Uh, the subfloors are particle board, and in some cases can have some vulnerable spots where we cut out, we fix, and typically we're fixing that with an OSB product just so it's stronger. Most areas where you're gonna have issues, like any home, would be where water is, such as like sinks, dishwashers, uh, bathtubs, bathrooms, laundry rooms, things like that, or anywhere where you have windows that potentially leak. Sometimes you're gonna have vulnerabilities in front of a, a wall there, on a wall there. But I mean, for the most part, as far as construction goes on the more modern homes, you're typically going to see some of the same stuff as what you find in, you know, fiberglass. You're going to find that in your standard home, entry level home, that was built around the same era. Um, the plumbing's a little bit different in a lot of cases. I don't know if you can see it. They've got a lot of times they use a lot of polybutylene. You can look that up and find out how wonderful that is. 
Uh, that was a product that was also used back in the late 80s, 90s in regular site built homes too. So not a whole lot different than what you're going to find in a typical site built home. The big, big factors uh, are, you know, how it's transferred, how it's taxed, where it's located are going to have some additional factors and also how eventually it, you know, it gets here is going to be another factor. So those are some of the big things that I would say uh, are variables that happen with manufactured homes versus site built homes. Uh, from a financing standpoint, manufactured homes that are sitting on leased land are characteristically harder to finance. Uh, typically, you're going to be required to put a larger down payment in most cases and pay a higher interest rate. So that's a different one because it's considered mobile and higher risk. So there's that situation there uh, versus what you'd have. They don't have an FHA program, a VA program necessarily for uh, mobile homes sitting in parks to help with down payment assistance and things like that. We get asked that on a regular basis, but unfortunately, nobody has jumped on board with that when it's sitting in a park yet. So there is that variable. There is ongoing lot rent. And uh, basically from the connection point of utilities, from the, the meter into the house is your responsibility. From the meter beyond out to the street where the connection point is in the community, that's their responsibility. So it's almost like an HOA that way. You do have a park manager that's going to require you to do regular upkeep and maintenance on the home on the exterior. Uh, specifically as far as debris goes, painting goes, you know, just overall upkeep, keeping it clean, painted, skirted, uh, as well as also any sort of like a typical HOA requirements. Now, they're not, not HOAs. You don't have a diplomacy, if you will. <laughs> uh, you do have a company and an individual who is managing the community and they have certain responsibilities from a corporate standpoint as far as what the quality and condition that the homes need to be maintained in that park up to. The furnace systems are typically different. There are ones that can be downdraft versus updraft. Uh, this one happens to be downdraft, meaning that the, all the ducts would be underneath the home rather than pushing it up up into the ceiling and having a duct system across the ceiling. So a lot of your regular homes, site built homes, will have a system that is an updraft versus downdraft system. Uh, site built typically is that way. Um, you do have a scenario where, like I said, some manufactured homes, some uh, manufacturers actually have the option in certain areas where it would be updraft versus downdraft. Modern day boxes are, are similar. You have your main breaker and then you have the respective um, connection points. And a lot of them can be expanded. Uh, the mobile homes typically do get a bad rap. Hi, kitty kitty. That they have all aluminum wiring since 1976, June of 1976. Uh, that has not been the case where there's aluminum wiring. And then also just like any site built home that I've been in that was built earlier in the early era, uh, you could have a situation where you have the Federal Pacific boxes that do not have a main breaker that will uh, go and click everything off, the whole box off, that if you have something that starts as a fire, that it just won't click off and you could have the fire take place. So Federal Pacific boxes do exist in mobile homes from time to time as well as site built homes. So as you can see, all in all, they're not crazy different uh, as far as construction and needing permits to be set and those types of things uh, than site-built homes. So hopefully that gave you a little bit more understanding, uh, maybe even put your mind at ease that in some cases, that's the reason why I like it, is that you have less cost associated with a close, buying and selling of it. You have less obstacles, less people involved. And as long as you do your, some of your initial due diligence, you could even do a closing 
on the top of your hood of your truck <laughs> or on a kitchen table or in a McDonald's. I've done closings in a variety of different places. So you don't necessarily have to worry about a lot of the nuances that you would experience with site build homes and a lot of other parties having an opinion, especially also, you know, even with the larger finance companies, when they're involved, there's quite a bit more paperwork that's necessary. But ultimately what ends up happening is it's a scenario where uh, it's a lot easier to, to do that kind of closing. Now they, they, they're going to require more paperwork, but and dots, I's, cross T's, they will have an appraisal done, they will have an in-home inspection done. There's going to be more paperwork to sign, uh, but ultimately they just want the title sent back to them if they're doing financing. And once that happens, then they'll uh, typically send out their check to pay it off in full. So hopefully uh, this gave you some better understanding as to the benefits of manufactured homes in comparison to site-built homes. And you can see some of the great potential that you have when you play in a trailer park.